Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right. So before I knew it, Thanksgiving is upon us. I've been procrastinating a lot the past couple of months on reviews and studying, and it's crunch time for both. I've got a backlog of wines, so let's jump into some wines that I think would go great for Thanksgiving. We have two from Bordeaux and one from Australia. All these wines are free samples and I have complete freedom to review them how I wish. Let's start with the white Bordeaux. This is coming from Chateau de Chantegrive. It's called Caroline. This winery was founded in 1966 by Henri and Francois Levic. In order to purchase their first two hectares, they had to sell their stamp collection. That's kind of a new one for me. Anyway, the winery is located in the Graves region of Bordeaux. This is the southwestern part of the region and includes prestigious appellations such as Pessac Lignon, Serrans, Barsac, and Sauterne. Graves is also where the first growth Chateau Aubryon is located. Now, this is the only first growth outside of the Medoc. The winery is located within the Serrans AOP. Now, this AOP can only be used for sweet dessert wines. Dry wines from sweet wine AOPs like Serrans, Barsac, and Sauterne can only use the Grobs AOP. I have two wines from them, their White Caroline and their namesake Red Wine. Caroline was created in 1988. They were going for a Burgundian style of winemaking and they say they were among the first to do this. They aged the wines in 225 uh, liter barriques on, on the lees and did regular stirring of the lees. This allows the lees to impart a creamier or broader mouthfeel. It can also improve stability, reduce the impact of oak flavor, and reduce the aroma of hydrogen sulfide. This last part is something that happens when a wine goes through a process known as reduction. Lees scavenge oxygen from the wine. This is a very gross oversimplification, but basically that's what happens. Now, while reducing the amount of oxygen contact in a wine is generally good, you still need a small amount of it. It's a balancing act. Too much or too little can cause off flavors and aromas. With wine, if you had to choose, it's, I guess, better to have too little since the moment oxygen makes contact with the wine, it'll, quote, blow off those aromas. Now, you can't do the same thing if too much oxygen got into the wine. Now, again, it's a balancing act, so, but, so because while these aromas can blow off, if the wine is reduced too much, that aroma or flavor may stick around in the form of other compounds. And there's a bunch of other things that can happen, you know, with all the types of winemaking, but this is a very, very simplified explanation. Now, stirring the lees helps break things up, so to speak. So it slows down the development of hydrogen sulfide by actually introducing oxygen in small amounts back into the wine. So that also means if you do it aggressively or frequently stirring or too frequently, um, you can cause well, oxidation. So yeah, winemaking can be complicated. Now, the red wine looks like it goes through the normal winemaking process, at least for red wines. The third wine I have is from Australia. It's a Pinot Noir from Yalumba. I'm much more familiar with this winery. These guys have been around since 1849 in the Barossa region of South Australia and are Australia's oldest family-owned winery. The winery was founded back then by Samuel Smith when he planted the first vines that year. Over the years, they've grown and become well-known. They also have the largest solar array in Australia and are committed to sustainability. This includes how they farm and those they contract with. Uh, they talk about not using chemical sprays during farming, which is expected. They utilize cover crops and also reduce the amount of water they use, including recycling water. And sustainability usually includes business practices to reduce the impact on the environment and how you treat your employees through, working, th uh, through your working conditions and fair pay. Their site says they do minimal intervention in their winemaking. Their wines are vegan friendly. This means they don't use animal products in the production of wine. This almost always refers to the finding or gross filtering of a wine. 
Products like gelatin, milk, eggs, and fish bladders can be used here. Alternatives are clay and a compound called PPVP. Many of their wines feature what they call wild fermentation. That's also referred to as native yeast fermentation. This means that commercially created yeasts are not used, but the yeasts that are already on the grapes and present in the winery instead. FYI, there are a lot of different strains of yeast that cause fermentation in general. Native yeast fermentation relies on this menagerie of strains. This can add to the idea of terroir and vintage variation to wines. When you use commercial yeasts, you're normally using one strain. These strains are stronger strains that overpower any native yeast that come in. Commercial yeast allows you to have a much better control of the fermentation, so you can pretty much dial in the final outcome of the wine. Future mark here. So I dropped the ball with Chateau Chengrieve. I forgot to talk about their sustainability program. So they're part of the HVE or HEV in French. So the, I'm sorry, HEV is English, High Environmental Value, HVE in French. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. So they are a level three. That is the top level. Levels one and three are like really basic stepping stones. This is through the Ministry of Agriculture in France. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a system. You have to get certifications. Uh, if you look at the map I'm showing, the majority or the, the highest number of farms, in this case, probably vineyards, that are level three are in the Bordeaux area, um, especially the, the one department that the, the Gironde area that you see with 212. The next lowest or next, the next one down is Champagne area, the largest department in Champagne, 193. Champagne also has their own thing. And I mentioned something about this in my sustainability uh, episode from a couple years ago. I'll link to that below. But the bottom line is that France has their own sustainability program, just like Australia does. I've also got a link to Australia's official um, sustainability programs. So you want to check all that stuff out. And in general, every country that has a sustainable program pretty much is the same as everywhere else. There will be differences, but they're kind of slight. But the idea is, are you good stewards to the land? Uh, are you good stewards to your community and are you good stewards to your own employees? Those are the three like legs of the tripod, the three pillars, if you will, of a sustainability program. Again, not each country and even within countries, you may have competing sustainability standards like the United States doesn't officially have one, but you have a lot of counties or a lot of wine growing areas that have adopted their own. Lodi rules is probably the most famous of all that. So, but they all kind of have the same goal is, is to do, I said, good stewards of the land, good stewards to your community, good stewards or good, good to your employees. Um, I have a graphic up from Chateau Chagrive, uh, for biodiversity resources on Entrant. Uh, Entrant is inputs. So traditionally in agriculture, your input is what you put into the land in when you're for your agriculture. And that usually means your chemical sprays. So your pesticides, herbicides, any fertilizers, that type of stuff. They obviously don't use chemical versions. There are organic versions of it. Um, the graphic, I, I'm, not, I'm not translating all this. I'm just kind of looking at it. There are organic versions of treatments you can do in the vineyard. They are probably using them. Uh, there's also biodynamic versions that would qualify as organic. Um, but you also see resources are, you know, water reclamation and recycling, just recycling in general, you know, lowering your energy uses, using composting on uh, the biodiversity. I mean, it's like having a bunch of different flowers and other plants and, um, insectaries and all kinds of other things that you're trying to have a biodiversity. They talked about how they also will leave, uh, they'll leave some things fallow. So, um, they, they have a part of our vineyard is left fallow to flower for the delight of our insect auxiliaries, which are like your insectaries. Uh, in 2021, one of our plots will be dedicated to the cultivation of flowers that are especially attractive to honeybees. You know how I love, no, I don't love bees, you know that. Um, so that they will have everything they need to do their job in our vines. Um, I won't be going through that little area if I visit them. I'll look at it from afar and we can talk about how beautiful it is and how wonderful it is. But yeah, you know, me and me and bees, really me and wasps. I don't, we're, we don't, we're not friends. But anyway, so I wanted to make sure I, I highlighted this. I also will have a um, link, I have a link to the French 
uh, HVE stuff. I also have a link to Australia's sustainability program. So you want to check them out, go deep dive on that. But that's what Yulumba is using. And uh, let's get back to wherever part of the video we're getting back to. Now let's get the stats for the wines. First, we have the 2020 Chateau de Chancreve Caroline. Suggested retail price, what I can tell is $30. It's from the Graves region. It's 60% Sauvignon Blanc, 40% Semillon. It's hand harvested, uh, cold maceration and fermentation for three weeks. It's aged surly, which means on the lees, for nine months in French oak. 50% is new with regular batonnage or stirring. The ABV is 13%. And the ageability is five to 10 years per the back label. For the second wine, we're going down under. It's the 2022 Yalumba The Y Series Pinot Noir. The suggested retail price is $15. It's from South Australia. It's Pinot Noir, uh, for presumably 100%. The harvest was done in February and March of 2022. Not sure if it's hand harvested. This is kind of difficult in Australia, but it's possible. Uh, stainless steel fermentation, no mention of oak aging, wild fermentation, vegan, gluten-free. All right, so another wine using an unnecessary buzzword. This is from the text sheet that I got from the PR firm that supplied this bottle. It's actually not on the bottle. The TA is 5.52 grams per liter. The pH is 3.65. The total SO2 is 73 parts per million, and the ABV is 13.5%. All right, for the third wine, we're going back to Bordeaux. It's the 2020 Chateau de Chancreve Rouge. Uh, from what I can tell from looking online, because I didn't get the pricing either for this one, it's around $30. It's from the Graves. Uh, it's blending of two grapes, 60% Merlot and 40% Cabernet Sauvignon. Cold maceration, no time specified, but this helps extraction. Thermoregulated fermentation for three to four weeks at 28 degrees Celsius or 82 degrees Fahrenheit. That just means it's temperature controlled fermentation. Uh, it was aged in French oak. 50% was new for 12 months. The ABV is 14.5%. The back label recommends decanting for two hours. We don't have an ageability, but I would say probably five to 10 years at least is normal. All right, let's get into the wines. All righty. So, oh, here we go. I'm like, where's the thingy? Uh, I got a ton of wines, like I've, I've kind of said in the, some other episodes, and uh, I am super backlogged. So if you're one of the people that supplied me wines, I'm finally getting to everything. And the Bordeaux wines, I actually got four Bordeaux wines, and it was for the purpose of holiday stuff. And like, I don't really want to do four wines for Thanksgiving. So... That's why I, I only did two. The other two Bordeaux from a different winery, um, I'll do those for, for uh, Christmas. And then I plan to do a um, Argentine sparkling wine for that one uh, as, as wine number three. Now, um, I've, got, I've got some New Zealand stuff that uh, should be right after all this stuff. Well, right after this episode is the another Texas winery. And then after that, uh, I plan to do the three... New Zealand wines, probably one per episode. And that one, really just because I've had those wines for a while, I think I'm going to do a Monday, Friday, Monday release instead of just, you know, Monday, Monday, Monday. Then Christmas. And then after that, I um, mean, you know, I've got an Italian wine to do. I've got, what else do I have? I've got the, I've got the Carmenaires from Chile. Oh I've, oh, I've got some Ron Rubin wines. I'm excited about those. They're all, they're all in plastic bottles. So I'm, I'm excited to talk about uh, why uh, they're doing that and how that can be helpful to the environment. Yeah, and then the Carmen Airs, and I've got a whole bunch of, I mean, I got, I got a lot of wines. In the meantime, I'm still supposed to be studying for the exam, February 22nd. I haven't mentioned it in the other episodes, but I do have a link in the description um, for to my PayPal account. If you want to throw me a couple ducats to help pay for the exam, uh, I mean, all told, between... The theory exam, which is 400 bucks, and then the other exam, which is a thousand plus all the travel. I mean, we're looking at 2,500 to 3,000 dollars total. Um, I mean, I, I'll get the money, but it would be you've got a few extra ducats to throw me throw my way. That'd be awesome. All right, let's get in to this wine. 
So uh, we've got little, we've got kind of a deeper golden color or yellow color. Um, not unusual for the grape varieties we're talking about here with uh, Semillon and uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Now, they they do make a dessert wine. They make a Serrans wine, and uh, I don't remember. It's 100. percent I think it's 100 percent Semillon. Um, I'll put the lower third if it's different. If it's Sauvignon Blanc, I'll put the lower third or a little thing over here. But uh, they do 100% on that. So this isn't necessarily a dry version of their dessert wine because the dessert wine is 100% of one variety. Um, but anyway, so color's good. We got tiering, kind of medium plus on that. And what was this? It was 13.5, 13%? Yeah, about right. Let's get on the nose here. Clean the sound. It smells really good. So we got like a great combination of things. So Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon, they're, they're really great blending partners. And so with the Sauvignon Blanc, you're getting, you're getting the things like that papaya, gooseberry, uh, a touch, a touch of pyrazine, since Sauvignon Blanc has a ton of it in it. So you're getting a little bit of that jalapeno, bell pepper, also getting a little bit of papaya, oh, I thought you said papaya, pineapple. It, I get like the, um, I get like the Hawaiian pizza thing going on. But I also get a little bit of waxiness, and that's the semion coming through. Semion, well, what it does is it helps, uh, and since it's not as a hot, not as high of an acid grape, it will help kind of smooth things out a little bit. In addition to the lees stirring, now I don't smell anything necessarily that tells me, oh, there's lees going on here. But I also have a hard time identifying lees um, in things like Chablis. Um, so a wine like this, which is already going to be highly aromatic. It, it might just kind of get lost. I mean, it may, it may be more about the mouthfeel. I mean, it's clean smelling, uh, like wet rock, wet concrete. You know, I've got that herbaceousness with the um, with the with the pepper, with the with the bell pepper and the jalapeno, but also a little bit of hay, um, a little bit of grassiness to it. Yeah, it smells great. Let's let's taste it. It's really nice. It's bright, but not overly bright. It's not like having New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. That Semillon really, really kind of smooth things out. And really kind of on the, like a few seconds into it, it really broadens it out. That waxiness kind of comes through. It's kind of like you got like, like golden apple, like, like a waxy apple thing going on. Um, but you get, you get lemon, you get lime, you get the papaya, get the, the, the pineapple really coming through. And the pyrazine part, the, the, the bell pepper jalapeno is a little more muted. Um, it's kind of in the background. It's kind of just chilling. It's like, you know, one of those ESPN sports, you know, game day signs. So, hey, I'm back here. Um, I, never, I, I, I kind of wish I'd, I'd been able to do that at some point. It's not like a lifelong wish, but they've been running commercials about the, the first guy who did it. By the way, the sign in the commercial is a replica of the original because he didn't know he was making, quote, history, I guess. So he threw out the original sign. It's a cool story if you look it up. But yeah, I mean, it's a great combination of things going on here. Um, I mean, there's a broader mouthfeel. So like I said, that the Semillon can be doing that, but the Lee's stirring, the surly aging is also probably contributing to that. It's super delicious. So like, this is your first coarse wine. Now, granted, I do like to start things with sparkling and many times I will use a sparkling wine as the first wine for, for Thanksgiving in addition to Christmas. Um, but I really wanted to put this trio together, but this is like your first course. This is your salad. You might have a, you may have a fruit course. You may have a charcuterie thing going on. Uh, this will cut through all the, even, even with the meats, so if you'd have like, you know, salamis and stuff like that, it'll cut through the fat of those, the cheeses. Um, if you have any fruit going on with that, uh, antipasto, you know, that's basically Italian charcuterie. Um, it would go great with, you know, savory type of salads. You can have olives, you know, like an olive salad thing going on. Spinach salad. You got like the blue cheese, especially the blue cheese. Um, some balsamic vinaigrette or maybe blue cheese dressing. Um, pecans, candy pecans. You could do arugula salad. You could do kale. Because kale's so bitter, and this isn't necessarily sweet, but there's a good amount of fruit, so it might balance out that. Especially if you, especially if you have like some cranberries in the kale salad. It's not my favorite salad, but occasionally I do enjoy something like that. 
But yeah, and then this also could transition into, say, if you're going to have a uh, a chicken dish um, or a pork dish, that this would be a great transition into that. Um, it is super delicious. My mouth is really watering. Uh, great acidity to it. Really bright. Absolutely. So here's the thing, uh, before I get any farther, uh, uh, the Bordeaux wines. So like I said, I wasn't given any pricing. I had to look up online. And honestly, it, it was kind of hard to find anywhere that sold it that wasn't like a small wine shop. So from what I can tell, you're not going to be able to find this in, say, a big box store. Like, you know, like if you're going to go to a major supermarket chain or even like it didn't show up on wine.com. It did not show up on, on Total Wine. So things like that. Maybe you'll find it like at a Costco because Costco wines never show up like on your regular searches. Occasionally there's like there's that blog that does all, all about Costco wines, but you kind of have to search a different way to get those wines. So you might be able to find it some, at some place like a Costco. But if you can find find the right now, at least the Caroline, it's nice. And it's super tasty. Oh, OK, let's go to the Pinot Noir. It looks like a Pinot Noir, which is nice. Uh, so it got a little bit of translucency. It's kind of a, a lighter red ruby type of thing. There's a little bit of, I want to say, it's actually a little bit of darkness to it. Kind of brown, but that's fine. I mean, this is a 20, 20, 2022, so it's pretty, it's, only, it's like a year and a half because it was, you know, harvested, you know, March, sorry, February, yeah, February, March. So, I mean... It's not, it's not that it's brown, but there's like a darker red to it, okay? As far as tearing, yeah, we're talking medium on that. What was the alcohol on this? Was it, was it 14? 13.5, okay. Let's smell it. Ooh, okay. All right, digging it. It's a little bit different. It might be that wild fermentation. Yeah, it's it's a little bit... Not funky, but there's like a little bit of of um, kind of a smokiness to it. Yeah, in a good way. So you know, over the last few years, we've heard, we've heard a lot of like fires, you know, in California and Australia had a bunch of wildfires. Um, so and this is kind of a natural thing that happens. But we've had some more wildfires than normal, and they kind of were near vineyards. So it's not that kind of smokiness. And it's like, uh, oh, what is it? There's this wood characteristic. It's not that it's oak barrel, but there's like this, like you walked into like a room with a bunch of like mahogany wood, tobacco, tobacco. You're, you're hanging out in your smoking jacket with your pipe, okay? And here's the funny thing. I haven't even mentioned fruit yet because the first things I got were that, that smokiness, like you are smoking a pipe and might be a little bit like a, like a minty type of thing with wood paneling. But it's also, you've got this kind of dried cherry thing going on, dried cranberry. It's almost an old fashioned aroma to it. Now, I, I hesitate with that because, you know, that, that would indicate, you know, some barrel stuff. And let's see, it said stainless steel, no mention of oak at all. And, you know, with, with that old fashioned type of look to it or smell to it, it's like a, like a bourbon thing, a whiskey lactone, which would only come from barrels, but it's not really that it's earthy. It's savory. It's, oh, you know, it's a little bit of like eucalyptus. A little bit of mintiness, more spearmint. The, the thing is, I'm, 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 there's, there's, there's this one aroma, and I keep throwing darts trying to describe it, and I'm missing. It's like whatever that aroma is, the bullseye, and I'm like on the outer, I'm on the outer ring. Man, it's driving me crazy. Let's just let's get on the palate. Maybe, maybe I can identify it there. It's very prominent on the palate, and it's. It's very incense like. Yeah. So you've got you got the dry cherry, you got the dry cranberry. They are not the star. They're not the they're not the stars of the show. Um, you've got that kind of minty spearmint thing going on that got a little bit of sagebrush. You've got that 
touch of smoke. You've got that leather, leather. Um, so you're, you're hanging out in your in your study with the wood paneling, with the old books, and sitting in your leather like recliner with your smoking jacket and your pipe, and you're eating you're eating dried out Luxardo cherries. That's right. That's where that old fashioned thing, but no whiskey lactones. And whatever else, this is really cool. Again, there's a, there's an aroma and a flavor that I can't pinpoint, but you have all this other stuff going on. It's really cool. I like it. And it's 15 bucks. That's cool. So this is total main course, right? You've got your, you got your turkey and your stuffing. You've got the cranberry sauce. You've got your green bean casserole thing going on. Um, yeah. I mean, this, this is absolutely like spot on. And because it's not a fruit bomb by any means. It's not sweet. It's dry. Um, man, it, it's, it's cool. It's really cool. Yeah. With the stuffing. I mean, this is, this is some pretty kick-ass stuff. All right, let's go to the bar. Let's go to the the red Bordeaux. So deeper color. I mean, kind of expected with Cabin Merlot. Uh, kind of a really deep ruby red. Uh, we got a little bit of staining on the glass, moderate staining. The Pinot, of course, it had basically no staining, like it like it should be Pinot. Naomi, what? Sorry. Um, and then tearing. Yeah, kind of medium on that. This one, I think, was 14.5, though, wasn't it? Yeah, this is 14, 14, 5, 14, 3, 14, 5. All right. A little bit of, a little bit of heat on that, huh? Ooh, wow. <clears throat> this has a richness to it, right? You got some really nice black fruit, red fruit, blackberry, cranberry, strawberry, raspberry, black raspberry, blueberry, plum. And you get the vanilla, the clove, the cinnamon. You get that like you just walked into the barrel room. I mean, it is 50% new. Yeah, you just, it smells like you just walked into the barrel room. I love barrel rooms. They, they love how they smell. Yeah, you've got... Um, sage is like my new, my new descriptor. Like, all of a sudden, like, I've been using sage the last few, last few reviews. And I've talked about it off camera. Because um, somebody talked about sage. And I was like, oh, yeah, I, I kind of forgot that. That um, descriptor, tobacco, dry tobacco, not like you're in your smoking jacket pipe, but like like fresh. It's like you laid out the tobacco leaves. Yeah, I mean, it it's it sells for probably about thirty dollars, and of course in Europe it's only like sixteen euros, but it smells like more expensive, and that's because of the new oak. Now in France the new oak is probably cheaper than it is here, but. Touch of earthiness, fresh tilled earth. Yeah, let's taste this thing. You know, this is this is what really good red wine that's got cabin merlot. It's more merlot than anything else. And this is also this also speaks to how really good merlot based wines can be. This wine is fantastic. Um, so the fruit is riper. Um, it should be with a 14.5% alcohol, but it's not sweet, uh, not sweet tasting. It's just ripe. It's kind of juicy. My mouth's also watering. Um, the tobacco leaves come through a little bit more. Um, I've also got some, um, the sage again, the fruit, like I said, the fruit's juicy, but it really finishes dry. Like it kind of has a little bit of ripe attack and it finishes dry. Like classic old world, classic old world wine. It really is like more blackberry than anything else. Um, and then there's like a, a little bit of fern and mint. So Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon, more Cabernet Sauvignon than Merlot can have that pyrazine quality that gives you that bell pepper, um, but also can give you... Um, uh, it can also give you that greenness to it, a little bit of greenness. Tannin is really nice. It's not overpowering. It's actually kind of smooth. Uh, the Merlot tends to have softer tannin than Cab. 
but it feels a little aggressive, but it, it's, it's fine. Um, acidity is pretty good. I would call like a medium, almost medium plus on the acidity. So they must have retained the acidity really well. Oh, they could have acidified it, but they don't really do that that much. You know, I've had some other Bordeaux wines recently, and they were more like in the 15 ish to $20 range. This, this is way better. Like spend the extra money, get to the $30 price point or $25 price point, and you're getting something a little more polished. The tan is really starting to become a little more noticeable now. So for Thanksgiving, you still could do this with the turkey, with the stuffing, because you got a lot of stuff going on. Um, and the cranberry sauce, and, and you've got, you know, all the accoutrement, right? But if you were like having, say, roast beef, great. This would be great with ham, the Pinot Noir. But the, the, the Bordeaux, if you're having like roast beef, especially if you're going to have like a horseradish sauce on it, uh, some au jus, this would be fantastic for like a roast beef thing or just straight up steak. You're doing like steak. This is a badass wine for steak. Yeah. A little Bernays sauce on there. Killer. I don't like seafood, but I can see you doing an Oscar topping if you want to do that. That cinnamon clove, vanilla, nutmeg coming through on the palate now. It's really tasty. I'm super happy to get these wines. Um, now, you, like I said, I don't know where you can find them. So it's, it's a little frustrating. I got these wines. Um, and not that, not that every wine that gets sent to me, they tell me where you can find it. But usually they're easier to find online. Um, I, I went online to find more about this because they didn't have really that much. I mean, it has a, I had like not real text sheets, but I'd gotten some, some like information, but the website had effectively the same stuff, but had a little bit extra things. Um, but yeah, I, all three wines are fantastic. I want to try this again. God, I really, I don't know what the extra thing in here is, but it's intriguing me. And the, the, the uh, white, wow, man, it's still going strong. Yeah, if you can find, especially the Bordeaux wines, if you can find the Bordeaux wines, you definitely should buy them. The Yalumba should be easier to find. Again, you should find it and buy it. 15 bones for that, it's awesome. All right, that's gonna do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, and then tell your friends, and we'll see you next time. Maybe with some uh, Aussie Pinot.